I'm here with Adam Green, who is an archaeologist who wrote the paper Killing the Priest King, Addressing Egalitarianism in the Indus Civilization. Adam Green, could you introduce yourself and tell us why the Indus, civiliz- why the Indus Civilization is worth writing a paper like this about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, have this discussion today. So I am a postdoctoral researcher at the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research and uh, at the University of Cambridge. And I specialize in the Indus civilization specifically, uh, more broadly in South Asian deep history, and in particular on the comparative study of complex societies. So I'm, I'm very interested in the changes that occurred uh, mostly in the Bronze Age, so after farming had been around for a while and people started to agglomerate into big cities and they, they started to form, they started to form things that we would call cities, they started to form things we called states. And I've always been interested in sort of the package of social changes that were supposed to have occurred there because in old sort of traditional anthropological narratives, that was kind of the moment when a lot of researchers said society became like it is now, so to speak. You, you, once you get cities and states, you get things like kings, warfare, uh, long distance trade. All, all, all this stuff was in, in older models, especially supposed to be uh, corresponding to these first cities. However, when you went to the sort of data available from a lot of the first cities in the world, the picture was always far more complicated. And Mm. in the big classic sites where uh, a lot of, where a lot of this research emerged, such as Mesopotamia even, uh, there's been sort of increasing trouble with this narrative, this narrative of Mm. the big hierarchical centralized state society taking over everything. There's been Mm. sort of growing criticism of that idea. And so I was particularly interested. I I was drawn to the Indus civilization actually very early as an undergraduate because right off the uh, bat, it didn't really look like the sort of classical complex societies that were described in the old. Sorry. Yeah. Can can you just, what, what exactly is your definition of a complex society? Yeah, I'm using a term very loosely. So complex society uh, is... I I suppose the the quickest way and probably the the safest way to define a complex society would be those with cities and states. Those with a city, which were often believed to have gone along with the state. Cities, uh, obviously both city and state are themselves difficult to define in a way that makes sense across culturally. So Mm -hmm. I, I, I tend to kind of frame it in terms of a research tradition where uh, of people who've been studying things like cities and states and arguing about what a city was and arguing what a state was. All right. Does that? Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's good. <laughs> um, so you were talking about the Indus civilization and how it didn't fit these models. Yeah. So the Indus civilization is referring to the first, uh, the, but what most, what most uh, scholars would call the first cities in South Asia. So it's a mm. series of, five really big sort of agglomerations of people uh, that are sort of zigzag across the Indus River Basin uh, all Mm -hmm. the way into Northwest India, where I work. And then the classical one is sort of Harappa in uh, Mm -hmm. Pakistan. And then in Sindh in Pakistan, there's also Mohenjo-Daro, which is probably the biggest and best known. And these, and then Dolavira on the coast uh, near Gujarat. Then there's actually an unexcavated site called Ganwariwala, in Cholistan. Hmm. And these these were these are early these are basically bronze age cities. So hmm. they're areas with all of the technologies uh, most often associated with bronze age cities, so writing, hmm. weights, measures, uh, standardized hmm. bricks, all this kind of all these things that were associated with the first cities in Mesopotamia and they appear to have mm. very large populations. I mean, Bronze Age large. So we're talking yeah, yeah. On, on the upper estimate, 30, 40,000 people. So they, they wouldn't be cities by today's standards, but they no, are quite right. large. 
and they're and they're unprecedented in terms of the archaeological record. There's nothing before them of that size and magnitude right. in South Asia. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can, I can, I can like edit this out so you sound really smart and like you know it just flows out of you. So don't worry about it. That's great. So I. That's why I said the, the, I, I got into the uh, end of civilization very, very early because it had these big things. It had these big cities. Everyone was talking about the cities, but it didn't mm. appear to have the other thing. The, it didn't appear to have uh, the sort of stratified social relations mm. that were so prominent in the classical examples at Mesopotamia. So the Indus civilization doesn't have, I mean, the, the core of the paper that you read, obviously, is that the Indus mm. civilization does not have big examples of people sort of investing a lot of labor in the construction of things that only benefit a tiny subset of mm -hmm. people. So the most classical example of what I would find convincing evidence for a ruling class or for a, a narrow group of people who are sort of disproportionately controlling the labor of others, what would be a sort of monumental tomb complex, something that a lot mm. of people are building and that only really serving the, a, a very small subset. So, you know, an, an, an old kingdom pyramid in Egypt yeah, of or course. the royal tomb of war in Mesopotamia are really clear examples. And the Indus just yep. doesn't have that, period. Mm. There's, there's nothing... There's nothing like that. There are there are strange uh, anomalous sort of mortuary structures in Gujarat that have only sort of recently mm. come to light. But even then, we're talking about uh, something that's just fundamentally on a different uh, level. Yeah, yeah. Like they're much. So they're, they're, they're much. Yeah. What do you What do you mean by strange exactly? What do I mean by strange? You mean what? Uh, the you mean the strange structures in Gujarat or the strange yeah. uh, civilization as a whole? <laughs> no, I, I mean I mean um, just the structures. Because um, like I assume yeah, like, so something like the <laughs> in in the past uh, ten years. Yeah, there's like a bit of a delay. It's annoying. Oh, it's okay. I mean, you're in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're speaking all the way yeah. across the globe. Um, the in Gujarat, there's been that. In the recent report of the sort of westernmost Indus city, which is called Dolavira, it, it, it's smaller than the other Indus cities. So Mohenjo-daro is quite large at about, at about 80 hectares in surface area, 200 hectares if you look at the out, outer areas. Um, mm. But Dolavira is maybe a third to half that size, but it's very ordered. It's very... Um, uh, it's, it's got sort of big rectangular blocks that were all built mm. uh, next to each other. And off a, a, a roughly half a kilometer from the site, there, there is a burial area. And, and mm. this, is, this is a pattern that's pretty common uh, across the end of civilization. But in two of those burials, they're, they're, they're big tumuli. So there's big stone structures erected mm. around what appears to have been a burial chamber. And that's mm. really, th those two are really the only urban phase. So structures dating to the period when Indus cities were right. at their yep. height. Yep. Uh, th those are really the only two structures across uh, an area that's, you know, over 800 square kilometers. Those are the only mm. two structures of something that begins to sort of qualitatively resemble the, right. the sort of, noble commoner line that you see in mesopotamia and egypt so, it, yeah. it, so if it's something that's going on it's, it's kind of the exception yeah. that's proving that the rest of the yeah, 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 yeah. Different. yeah like i like i imagine my like read of that would be like i don't know like you know maybe maybe you got like an elite for like a generation or something but like it didn't last something ephemeral i mean there's there's all kinds of like caveats and qualifications that you have to bring mm. up. So there's not a well-established pan-Indus chronology for the mm. urban period. So when you get into cities, uh, you're talking about a span of time that's about seven centuries long. Mm. And there have been attempts and local excavations. So at Harappa, 
where there's been sort of a long ongoing excavation the past 20 or 30 years. There's a finer chronology that's been established. They call it Harappa 3A, 3B, 3C. Mm -hmm. So you can see a little bit more the way the city uh, changes and develops over oh, time, wow. which is why, which is where a lot of arguments about uh, the sort of large scale mass building of the Indus civilization began breaking down in the nineties to begin with. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in Gujarat, we, we can't, we can't that I wouldn't, I'd say there's not really good, strong consensus about the way the different cultural levels in Gujarat line up with sort of the broader Indus phenomenon. There, there, there yeah, will be different right. opinions from different scholars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess that it's kind of a long way of saying we don't know exactly where the tumuli would fall within the mm. 700 year of the city. It could be a very late phenomenon. It could be something that right. flared up really quickly, kind of, kind of as you yeah. were pointing out. But I mean, yeah. Gujarat's different from the rest of this Indus for a lot of other reasons too. Like it's got mm. these very sort of highly fortified production sites, like mm. big wall, like huge walls around sites that are only one hectare. So really tiny mm. sites with huge walls with lots of craft debris in them. So people making a lot of things. Mm. And so it, it's got all these sort of weird patterns. It's also closest to Mesopotamia and mm. deeply connected to long distance exchange with mm. the sort of bronze age cities uh, on the, on the other side of the Arabian sea. So there, there's all these sort of particularities going on in Gujarat yep. that there's yeah, yeah, yeah. different ways of explaining. So it's kind of, yeah. it, in some ways it's unsurprising that we see uh, interesting divergences there mm. from yeah, yeah. what's happening across the broader yeah in yeah and, and in like and especially like over the you know the course of like seven centuries i mean that's just that is so much time yeah absolutely it, it's a huge period of time and it's it's uh, four it's four tumuli two two of which have been excavated and mm -hmm. neither produced actual human remains inside of them they're just the, the structures oh. are just similar to those that were producing huh. human remains so they're, well, they're, they're very <laughs> that yeah it's good to know that there's like still mysteries in this world um that that's fascinating um okay i think um i think i'm gonna like steer us a little bit back back more on track um could you could you just like talk about um because i i found it like it seemed when i was reading it um and i uh, you know you'll tell me if it's true or not but it seemed like what you were trying to get at was like uh, just, just like it seemed like a lot of like the arguments for like the existence of an elite were like really reaching, um, like you know they were really just trying to like you know fit this um like the data into like a pre existing paradigm I guess is one way you'd put it um so could you just like talk about some of the arguments for why even after you know discoveries had been made uh people were still like oh yeah you know like but you know this thing perhaps shows that there were actually elites yeah yeah and that and that's reflecting something that's going on in kind of the broader study of complex society again the broader study of the first cities and states or what i'd be mm -hmm. more comfortably talking about is bronze age economies so in the mm -hmm. late 80s early 90s there was this there was this sort of paradigm in archaeology called neo-evolutionary theory so people mm. were returning to the idea that big processes were changing sort of society from one form to another. And there's this mm. classical example put by uh, uh, Elman Service where you have like bands, tribes, states. Like yep. th th he, he's got like this really tight hierarchy. And it, this was influenced by a, a work of a evolutionary archaeologist, uh, uh, sorry, evolutionary prehistorian called V. Gordon Child who mm. wrote an article called The Urban Revolution in the 1950s. And this is an mm. extremely influential piece. Uh, Mar uh, uh, Child was a sort of Marxist historian. Yep. And he was very interested in revolutions. So he was very interested mm. in sort of how societies move from one phase to another. And he was also very empirically motivated. So he actually... Uh, visited uh, a lot of the early excavate, a lot of the early 20th century excavations. He visited them in person and kind of mm. looked at what he saw. And he was he assembled trait lists 
And so in the night and b- before 1950, he was very open to what he saw. And as a matter of fact, in his first book on the most ancient East, he was he 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 was convinced that South Asia was where the first cities appeared. Mm. Uh, it was later on with radiocarbon dating and further excavations that he kind of revised that. But anyway, mm. in the 1950s, he wrote an article that said there were uh that the, there was an urban revolution that followed the neolithic revolution so you have a revolution that gave us farming basically mm. and then later on there was a revolution that gave us cities and it's not really clear about sort of the time frame that this occurred but he said that once you get a certain set of traits uh then you have an urban revolution so obviously the big the, the city itself is the big manifestation but what you really have, what, what really gives you the urban revolution is uh, occupational specialization that's funded mm-hmm. by uh, food surplus. So his yeah. idea was that once there was enough resources in a society, you would get a tight uh, group, a, a tight, uh, what, what, I've, what he called a, a ruling class that would basically promote different economic specialists to support their position. And right, this yeah. idea was has been extremely influential through 30 years, and people kept sort of refining the processes that were supposed to give us that ruling mm. class with all their specialists. And mm. that went on through the 80s and 90s when it then started to get a little bit rocky. And in broader yeah. comparative archaeology... It, it, there was a huge debate about what was a state. It, it kind of took the form about what was a state and what wasn't a state. And mm-hmm. there was a huge pressure among anthropologists and archaeologists to decide whether or not the society they studied was a state or not. <laughs> so the problem was, as, as the definition, as people were saying, oh, maybe you don't have all these social traits moving together. Cause I mean, the empirical record was breaking that down. Basically mm-hmm. people were finding examples that didn't conform to child's trait list or that yep. moved through it in a different order or famously mm-hmm. moved back and forth. Uh, societies <laughs> that had cities, in one era, had cities in one era, didn't have them in another, then had them later. Yep. It would, would move back and forth, move from farming back to pastoralism, like, like all this kind of, back and forth and change people were starting to question the idea that this change was occurring at all the -hmm. problem was indus archaeology didn't really move in that direction what what happened was there was a there was an influential um in in the west anyway there was an influential Mm -hmm. anthropologist who was studying the indus named uh, walter fair service and he worked at the american Mm -hmm. museum of natural history he obviously wanted to figure out where the indus civilization stood in this debate about states and uh, complex societies. And Mm. so he sort of really did, (laughs) he really did a checklist. He really lined up what was known from the Indus civilization to what the new evolutionary theorists thought should be in a state Mm. society. And he argued quite clearly from the 70s onward that the Indus civilization wasn't a state. Now, the problem was that immediately put the Indus civilization outside of the, it it removed the Indus civilization from sort of the top tier of civilizations that everyone else was interested in. So, (laughs) and so there there was kind of this feeling that it had been somehow devalued because it didn't line up. I mean, despite fair service writing all about how interesting it was and how there was all Because he, he, he thought it was a series, he, he, he goes on to, to say it was a series of what he calls like sort of pastoralist uh, chieftains, like ch- chief, chieftain mm. societies that were all interacting on an unprecedented mm. scale. Like they were just much, much, yeah. much larger than anything else that was known. And uh, that he, he sort of received a lot of pushback. And uh, his later student, uh, Greg Passell, kind of made a similar argument that is sort of most clear in this chapter that he wrote in 1998, where he's arguing that the end of civilization, he calls it, so he calls it social complexity without the state mm. is, is what is what he wrote it. And he was almost like he, he, he received so much pushback in the conference where he 
produce this idea that he actually got kind of very nervous about the idea and, and, and was right. very reticent to talk about it further. So while, mm-hmm. while these two were kind of pushing, I call these, I call this sort of the non-state paradigm, the Indus non-state mm-hmm. paradigm. It's uh, fair service and his students were kind of arguing that the Indus civilization data did not fit the new evolutionary expectations for what you would find in a state mm-hmm. society. At the same time, you had this other group of scholars, mostly working out of the Harappa project, who began taking the opposite position. And most of the time they said the Indus civilization was a state level society. And they said that the reason we didn't recognize the Indus civilization as uh, as a state society similar to Mesopotamia and Egypt is because the state was just different in the Indus mm. civilization. Elites were just different. They were just hidden. But mm. or, you know, some, sometimes they would say they were hidden, sometimes they're not. They kind of that that is where this sort of implicit argument about uh, sort of elites running everything through peaceful trade mm. is kind of how it's kind of how they conceptualized it. And their evidence for this was simply the fact that trade existed. So <laughs> they argued that. So they, they, they kind of argued that, oh, there's there's materials moving from very uh, moving into into cities from very long distances. And I should say mm. that the empirical work was is really quite good. They have dem- there's right, been right. uh, quite a lot of evidence for the movement of material culture across incredible distances, thousands of kilometers for very right. particular uh, tastes in Indus mm. materials, most famously steatite. So the Indus civilization has been called, there's actually scholars who have called it the steatite civilization. It's this kind of soft white stone that's mm. used to make just bajillions of ornaments in the Indus civilization. Yep. Beads, uh, the, mm. the seals are famously made of steatite. And there's this work uh, by Randall Law where he demonstrates that not only were uh, was steatite from two very particular sources, one in the one in what used to be the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, and another in the Jammu, uh, it, another in the around the Shawaliks in, in Jammu in India. Mm. And not only did they pr- pr- choose steatite to make these objects and, and make them in huge quantities, uh, hundreds of kilometers mm. away, they, pr- they they used dolomitic steatite. So they used a steatite that tr- that sort of transformed and became white when it was heated in excess of 1200 degrees Celsius. And this, yeah. these very two very specific materials were used. So the specificity of that choice and the distance across which it had to be mm. acquired convinced the sort of state level archaeologists that this was something uh, elites must have been doing this. There must have been some really, uh, that there must have been some really powerful minority of people who were controlling and ensuring that this particular material was used. And that, that yeah. kind of became a very implicit argument. Another argument flowing from child was the idea that if you have specialists and specialized knowledge, you must also have elites. So that mm-hmm. was that, that is the other kind of big tenet of the uh, state level paradigm in the Indus that came out through the nineties and two thousands that, uh, if you have examples of individuals dedicating tremendous amounts of time to cultivating skill and knowledge in a particular craft, the only way that can happen is if somebody's controlling them or if, if someone's exerting power over them so that, that, Mm. that can be taken as evidence for elite. And I should note that that's been a popular argument in other areas outside the Indus as well. So they were taking this oh, yeah, argument and they were applying it to the Indus. And that's probably one of the most interesting things is over time, the criticism of the whole neo evolutionary framework has really broken. I mean, frankly, it's undermined the concept that it's undermined interest and in research on craft specialization in general. But huh. uh, in the Indus, it's a, uh, had kind of the opposite effect. Everyone wanted there to be elites in the Indus, so everyone started studying Indus crafts, which which <laughs> truly are quite spectacular. And, and Indus crafts are amazing. They were able to uh, make all this huge range of artificial materials, uh, artificial mm. seals, beads, materials. Yep. Um, 
vitrification processes. Some of these were still, archaeologists are still sort of reconstructing. Some of these knowledge mm-hmm. sets are still quite mysterious today. So like the, the vitrification of stoneware bangles, the creation of stoneware technologies, they heat up uh, just plain ordinary terracotta to temperatures mm-hmm. that effectively turned it to a glass-like material, gave a mm-hmm. conchoidal fracture. This kind of technology doesn't appear again until like mid- the medieval period. So thousands yep. of years between the Bronze yep. Age and this use of this technology and later. So all, all that was cited as evidence for elites. Um, mm-hmm. This has kind of always bothered me a bit because mm-hmm. it, 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 it doesn't occur to me why you would get, I mean, unless our, our, our sample is just so tremendously biased by the fact that it, there's so much research on the cities themselves. Um, mm-hmm. But in, in the cities themselves, most of the evidence for these sophisticated craft technologies is distributed throughout the site. So mm-hmm. there's no house or palace that's full of stoneware bangles, for example, yep. That, yep. Or, or full of seals. These things are found mm-hmm. all over the city, and they're found in different mm-hmm. quantities across the city, but, they're, but they are all over the cities. So yeah. it, it, it didn't sit well. I was kind of like, well, my initial interest in the fact that the Indus civilization lacked these monumental tombs, uh, it just kind of added on the fact that you didn't see uh, things like these craft goods being effectively monopolized by different mm-hmm. people. Also, yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned there was all this huge research into Indus crafts and into Indus technologies. Well, all of it kind of just kept producing the same story over and over again, that lots of different people were involved in the production, that craft, uh, that different artisans were in contact with one another, they were sharing knowledge, they were sharing techniques, mm-hmm. that there was yep. just all this huge... There, there was this huge flow between all these different artisan communities. So they, though they were specialized, they were doing really impressive things they weren't in they, they, they weren't being controlled they weren't being sort of coerced mm. or attached to anything really and mm. so all, all this kind of prompted me to say that the whole idea of social divisions and social inequalities in the indus needed needed sort of a, a big revisiting we, we needed to look at it again and mm. i kind of went back to an idea that jumped out actually before any of the neo-evolutionary model, before any of the models had really been applied to Indus material, the first thing that scholars noticed about the Indus civilization was the wide distribution of its public amenities. So John Marshall, who wrote the first, uh, who announced the Indus civilization to the world, wrote the first report based on the work of some uh, fantastic Indian archaeologists who uh, did uh, did most of the excavation work at Mohenjo-daro. Um, he he wrote that the most impressive thing about the Indus civilization is that it didn't have pyramids and it didn't have palaces, and that all the all the energy was lavished on houses, and and that really that that really surprised him. And he wrote that right there in the preface. When he goes in, if you read the first report on his excavation, he doesn't actually start out describing the large uh, non-residential structures, he actually begins his whole report with a description of a house. It's a big, it's a big fancy house, to be sure, but it's a house. And so th- this is all very striking. And uh, that got me thinking, why, well, why did we move away from this? Why did we just leave all these questions about the sort of egalitarian nature of the Indus civilization? We just sort of left those questions sitting on the shelf. And I'm, I'm hoping that, I mean, my aim with the article was to kind of get people back into those questions, start yeah. really dealing with the fact that you had this big complex society that did not have uh, strong indicators of a ruling class. And then I, I was very specific about what, h- how I could potentially be convinced. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, I also, another thing that I... Um, noticed and i don't know much about the history of it so maybe maybe i'm wrong but um they um it's also the sanitation um system that they had um because i know that like sanitation technology was really important for like reducing uh disease um you know everywhere around the world 
Um, and I, I think you mentioned something about how it, like, you know, it was an example of solving like collective action problems at scale. Uh, so, so could you talk about that? Like how, yeah. how like rare is the sort of sanitation, uh, infrastructure that they had, you know, for a bronze age civilization? Oh, I mean, Indus, the Indus drainage system is completely unprecedented in the archeological record before Indus times. You only get similar. So basically every single house at Mohenjo-Daro where there's good data available has a bathing platform. A later revisitation project found over 700 wells distributed throughout the, the site proper. So most houses had a well actually inside the house so they could provide their own fresh water into the house. But then they also had these bathing platforms and the bathing platforms were sloped so that the water would flow down into terracotta pipes that then went out into the street. But they didn't just dump into the street. What they did is they then joined uh, a channel that would lead to a sump pot. So it would lead to uh, a big pot sort of further down. So it effectively moved dirty water out of the houses and collected it into these sump pots, which would, which would probably have had to have been changed ever so often. Um, mm-hmm. it's, 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 they're, they're sort of similar. We're aware of similar technologies today, especially in the way a lot of like outhouses work in uh, mm-hmm. South Asia in particular. But what's interesting is that the houses, though they built their bathing platforms and their wells inside albeit using a relatively standardized set of technologies, like the bricks of a particular size, uh, bricks that fit together in a particular way, they all fed into a common drainage system that seemed to work mm. between the houses. So there had to have been a sort of civic level organizational authority involved, mm. or that there was an emergent uh, sort of collective group involved in sort of putting together this uh, drainage system and presumably ensuring its maintenance. Now, I will say there are scholars who have argued that that level of coordination would have required, uh, uh, again, uh, a ruling class and managerial elites, some (laughs) kind of stratified group. But to me, it's just an example of, uh, of sort of an emergent an, an mm. emergent solution to a collective problem that they, they mm. put together, they, they, they standardize the protocols for dealing with it because it mm. allows them to deal with it and it allows everybody to have a yeah. nice bathing platform in their house. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, I think that that is probably, I think we've actually seen the sort of collective face of the Indus in, in, in that regard. So you see it in the sump pits you see it actually mm-hmm. in the non-residential architecture. There are very big things that require mm-hmm. lots and lots of human labor in the Indus civilization. There's just no indication that those big things benefited a subset of people. Mm-hmm. So there's great accessibility to the, 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 there's famously the citadel structures of the, mm. of the Western mounds at Mohenjo-Daro, often called the stupa mounds. These were actually, the, these are just a series of very large mud and baked brick structures. One has the great bath in it. So one has a bath that can fit about mm. 20 people inside of it. But these, these structures are remarkably open. There's no wall around mm. the Citadel Mound, even though it's called the Citadel Mound. Uh, there, <laughs> there's no, there, there's no, like, it, it's not closed off. There, it hasn't been demonstrated that uh, these were benefiting sort of a subset of people. They certainly don't mm. look anything like Mesopotamian palaces, which to mm. me is the critical point. So we're not seeing yep. like, an, if they are administrative centers, there's no family living there full time or anything yep. like that. There, there's just no, that, that's just not how it looks. And there's certainly no aggrandizing of a particular mm. subset of people. So, yep. Yeah, the, the Indus ha- the, the, in the Indus, you have all these sort of uh, joint investments in these collective structures that are all very interesting. Mm. I've seen there are these small specialized structures that kind of lie outside the neighborhoods at important mm. junctures at Mohenjo-Daro. So the original excavators, the same, the same uh, 
actually a, a generation later than the guy who was impressed by Indus Houses, Ernst mm-hmm. Mackay. He he thought that he was picking up things like public hostels, is what he called them. So like huh. public sleeping rooms and public letter writers or letter. He, yeah, he called them spaces for public letter writing. There's a huh. hostel and a, a letter writing on the corner of one of the big intersections at Mohenjo-daro. Mm. And these aren't houses because they don't have the house structure. They don't have courtyards, but they are very public. And over time, they become more public and that they're accessible from every single side. And they have these kind of mm. small storage spaces that are off. I think if you ha- I think this is what collective management looks like in the Indus, these kind of shared specialized spaces that were at the mm. interstices of different neighborhoods, different houses. Yeah. And we and yeah, it's like we, we don't have good models for exactly how they worked, but we know they were there. Mm. It, mm. You know. Yeah, that that's that's really, really fascinating. Um and yeah, just just sort of like the um, you know, the mental image of like this public good that, you know, is sort of open from every side, um, and is not just like you can go in but also like appears very transparent. I think that's very powerful. Um so thank you for surfacing that. No, oh, yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being interested. A, lo- a lot of this stuff kind of remained uh, relatively off people's radar. I mean, it, it, if you can just, if the aim of your analysis is just to find the elite, then <laughs> most of the time, yeah, that's, yeah. That, m- most of the time that's pretty easy because the elite generally don't like to stay hidden. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they tend to be very materially noisy. And yeah, so... Yeah. It's always kind of bothered me about the Indus is there's no materially noisy elite, and that mm, and that yeah. has led again that actually led to the argument that their their quietness or mm. their relative invisibility in the archaeological record was actually a testament to how powerful they were. That <laughs> to be an elite in the Indus, you, you totally suppressed your your apparent differences with other. Yeah. Um, with other uh, people, so that the, mm-hmm. the the elite were distinct by demonstrating how common they looked, <laughs> like kind of a sort of like really really extreme puritanical. As a matter of fact, there's one scholar called them puritanical, like almost just totally mm-hmm. self denying uh, s- group of people. The thing that irked me, it, the, the the logical structure of that irks me though, because that means effectively an argument for highly centralized, powerful elites, uh, the evidence for elites would be the same as the evidence for no elites, <laughs> which means yep. we, we, is, is just not, that, that's not a, that's not a sort of a, a yeah, uh, yeah. satisfying <laughs> yeah, way to yeah. build um, knowledge. Yeah. You, you, I, I'm going to assume like you're familiar with um, Thomas Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolutions. Yeah, yeah. That that basically seems to me what's like going on here. It's like you know people are trying to fit uh, data into a like prior model, uh, and it's just not working. And you know the prior model has had so much invested into it that like they're just going to keep on fitting it in until you know what what what's that what's that old saying like you know um, science progresses one funeral at a time. That that might be <laughs> you know unfortunately where we're at. Um, I hope not, but yeah. Well, I think it's moving. I mean, I think that the data themselves are, are pushing, if we pay attention to it and if we're really clear, I mean, it's also so important to actually advance claims and Mm. to be willing to be wrong. I mean, I would be the first person to be astounded if they excavate the big city of Gunwariwala and find a palace and a pyramid. Mm-hmm. Like that, that would convince me that maybe my interpretation of the evidence mm. is wrong, but without, yeah. but given the data that we have, if we actually sort of do, uh, do hypothesis testing, do model building from what we can see, I mean, we have to come, mm. come to account of it and it's conspicuous that the sort of broader, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, the, the, the terrible sort of scholarly tradition of comparative complexity is so at a loss to, to explain sort of egalitarian 
uh, growth mm-hmm. to explain sort of egalitarian economics. And yep. that is, that, that, that's actually sort of the central thing that interests me. It's like, we have plenty mm-hmm. of ways of talking about how kings intervene in economies and collect taxes mm-hmm. and what the mm-hmm. different kinds of taxes they collect can do. There, there, there's tons of that. There's tons of um, theory of how trade impacts uh, different economies and how sort of conflicts between groups that build their power based on trade versus groups that build their power on sort of land and labor, how, how they contrast. But there's no, there's no way to have a similar conversation when, there, w- w- when you just simply don't have elite agency to fall back on. <laughs> and, and that and that's just really, I mean that that that's a big gap in our mm. knowledge of how humanity works, especially when yeah. you consider yeah. that. I mean, e- even if you took the even if you took neo evolutionary archaeology, or even if you took the neo evolutionary march to cities and states as given fact, it would mm. still only explain four thousand three three or four thousand years of human history versus, you know, 100,000 years of our existence as a species. Mm-hmm. So th- th- this is just, this just isn't satisfying to me. So I'm, I'm hoping the article can, well, I'm actually hoping the article gets uh, scholars outside the Indus to start paying attention to the Indus, because right mm-hmm. now the Indus is definitely not at the center of a lot of these conversations. Uh, and mm-hmm. it should be. I mean, and there's actually, frankly, there's other as we as we speak, the emerging archaeological evidence of sort of exceptions to the new evolutionary model for mm-hmm. sort of elite driven states is is starting to outweigh the the, the sort of classical <laughs> studies. Even Mesopotamia now, mm-hmm. the sort of temple palace driven economies of the mm-hmm. sorry the temple palace driven political economies of the third millennium, I mean, they took thousands of years to really mm. appear and, and, yeah. and cities were there long before. So like Jennings whole argument is that the, the Mesopotamian cities were there for thousands of years connecting to one another, whatever that means without, uh, without these sort of temples and palaces running everything. And that's, and, that, and that's a big gap there. So the end is, I mean, I, I set it up like the Indus is very exceptional, but in many ways, I think our understanding of what of how these early agglomerations of human of, of human societies, how these early population centers, how they operated, is just fundamentally wrong. And frankly, I think our continuing understanding of how uh, human polities operate mm. tends to be really blinded by these. Uh, no, no, noisy elites who do their aggrandizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I, are you familiar with um James C. Scott's work? Yeah, yeah, quite. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan of a lot of it. I think, mm. I, I think it gets challenging. But yeah, so J- James Scott's had a tremendous influence on archaeology, especially mm-hmm. recently, mostly through the work of uh, Norman Yaffe. Who's kind of a, okay. who's one of these head? He just had a he, he just had this volume come out on fragility in ancient huh. states and the whole idea that states simplify information uh, mm, in order yeah. to sort of operate that, that that the act of doing sort of state management things simplifies mm. the information coming in and going up to decision makers, which makes the whole which over time makes the system unable to account for its inherent complexity. Mm. That's, that's become a very big, uh, that, that, that's probably become a, a new sort of paradigm in a lot of archaeology of states. There's oh, that's fantastic. The, 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 the ancient state is going through uh, a, a bit of a heavy criticism period. However, mm. I am, my, uh, the only thing is, and I have another article which follows which kind of follows up on the killing the priest king article, which is mm-hmm. one about um, the ideas about debt that were put forth by David Graeber. Yep. And what and one of the things that strikes me is that yes, states, big centralized states, big hierarchical mm-hmm. political institutions 
they do like to simplify. They do like to monopolize information and use it. But mm-hmm. so does anyone else who wants to use information. Yep. So that's kind of yeah, the one yeah, thing yeah, I yeah. struggle with, yeah, with, with, yeah. with James Scott is that so- yeah. sometimes, sometimes yeah. you know, everyday households like to collect yeah. information about what other yeah, everyday yeah. households are doing. And I'm not sure what, whether that makes societies fragile or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. or less sustainable or whether that oversimplifies. I'm not sure. Oh, I haven't, I've, I've, I'm still thinking about that. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I can't believe I'm doing this, but um, are you familiar with um, Nassim Taleb? Yeah, the, the anti-fragile guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I, this is definitely not an uncritical endorsement. But um, like a lot of his work, a lot of his work is like, you know, um, because he's like he's like very concerned with like, you know, uh, these sort of like uh, like the amount of information that we can take in and the amount of information that we can like put out into the world is like very limited. And so like a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of like culture and like religion and economics is like basically uh, ways of like grappling with this problem. Um, and again, I don't believe everything. I don't, I don't like think that everything he writes is okay. Uh, especially cause he, he's kind of become increasingly crank, uh, like over the last decade, <laughs> but, um, he's like, I think like he's one of, um, like he's like sort of really taken that question and, um, chewed on it. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think, I think that like the, the, like, I think that the question of like how to, how to like simplify information so that, you know, you can make intelligent decisions in the world. I think like that is, you know, like the biggest question, um, going back forever, uh, and, you know, and, and obviously now it's like even more important in, you know, like an age of like crazy new technologies, like artificial intelligence or whatever, um, you know, like uh, there are still like hard limits to that, um, you know, which is why things like encryption works. Um, and I think I think like that is, you know, um, und- like it, it just like underlies a lot of things um, if you know how to look at it properly. And so, yeah, I think that I think that you asking those questions, I think, is fantastic. Um, and yeah, I really, I really hope you continue to do it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm whole. I'm, I'm very interested in in what I I, I try to build off Graver because Graver says that in order for a um, in order for a permanent inequality to emerge between mm. social groups, one social mm. group has has to have the means to specify what exactly is owed and mm. and, and what exactly what, what what exactly has to recur so I'm, I'm very interested in that concept and i i try to mm. say that there's a means of specification in all societies and yeah, that yeah, the yeah. means of specification it, it it encompasses everything how we measure things how yeah, we name yeah. things how we remember things and so in the yeah, end, it's like yeah. the means to specify were, were, the, were the seals. And it's yeah. telling to me that indices are found in all of the different houses at Mohenjo-Daro, huh. whereas the same technology in Mesopotamia, in sort of classic uh, temple palace Mesopotamia of the Bronze Age, you have a much smaller number of seals huh. relative to sealings. So you have a lot of ceilings, so the actual like uh, clay tags that were made with the seals, you find them in much larger numbers in Mesopotamia than you do in the Indus. Whereas in the Indus, you find much more seals evenly distributed than you do in Mesopotamia. That, and to me, that's yeah. pointing to in the Indus, everyone essentially, the, 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 means, to, the means to specify were effectively democratized. Huh. They, were in every, they were in every single household. So every single every single household was able to um, uh, record yeah. information about their interactions yeah. with other households. Whereas in Mesopotamia, yeah. the means to specify were monopolized by the uh, temple elite, by the temple palace yeah. elite. Yeah. They're behaving much more uh, the way child would have wanted them to behave. And I think, yeah. I, I think that well, whether, whether it's cause or effect is difficult to say. So whether, yeah. 
the democratization of the means to specify helped the Indus reproduce egalitarian social relations mm. or whether mm. it was a product of those egalitarian social relations mm. needs further research. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I have to think about no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer will be, but like, yeah, I think, I think just like that concept of like having a class of people that can like define sort of not define reality but like decide how we how like our thoughts and concepts are channeled um and then another class who can't like that that you know like if you just heard about that it might not be like immediately obvious but i think like that alone is like a really deep structural inequality that would be very hard to untangle um so yeah i i I think I think like you could really get something fascinating out of that. Well, and that, and that's one of the things. It's kind of the one of my background concerns about the Indus. So I'm in, in my in the paper. I, I'm very focused on managerial elites, and I'm very focused on urban data sets. And I'm convinced that in the urban data sets, there's no example. Uh, they're, they're they're just they just don't exist. However, the Indus civilization only had five cities that we know of. And it had thousands of rural settlements. And while the settlements that we know uh, that we know a lot about in, in the in the hinterlands, they're they're fairly rich. Like they have a lot of things. They, they, they seem to have a lot of the same technologies and abilities as the cities. Uh, mm. they're, they're relatively understudied. So we we need to know more about what the yep. sort of urban rural dynamic was yeah, yeah, in yeah, the yeah, Indus. Yeah, absolutely. Because like like seals don't appear in nearly the same numbers in rural settlements as they do in urban settlements. And it could be because in a rural settlement, you, 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 you may not be interacting with someone that you need to record mm. information about. Whereas mm, you, yeah. you would assume you're interacting with more strangers when you're in a city. Yeah. And so also there, there's all like, kinds of ways to explore it. Yeah. Yeah. And also like cultural dynamism in, in cities, I imagine would be like, it would be more culturally dynamic. Um, but yeah, no, that, that's really fascinating. Um, and yeah, I, I hope to read something on it one day published by you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, I, um, I, I don't know, uh, if this will elicit a response from you or not, but like, um, what, what would you say, like, let's say, you know, like, uh, knowledge about the Indus civilization because it becomes like common knowledge among like you know, uh, if not like the average person, like more, you know, wonkish or like, you know, politically, people who are like interested in like, you know, big big ideas and politics. Like, what what do you think like the consequences of that would be? Because, like, I don't know. Like, um, I did I did an episode a couple. I did a, a thing a couple episodes ago on like Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and implicit in like the narrative he puts in that is, you know, this sort of like steady progression where like, you know, once upon a time we were ruled by despots and things were bad. Um, but then, you know, liberal, liberalism came along and everything is now like, if not great, it has like the potential to be great. And I feel like, you know, relatively egalitarian mass societies like prior uh, pre-modern that are pre-modern like just kind of shoot a massive hole through that um so yeah it it feels like you know your um it feels like it would be a big deal so have you have you thought about like what the consequences would be i mean i try i I guess there's there's like consequences on on a lot of levels right so mm. on, on the one hand, I'm, I'm hoping that the Indus civilization and, pro- and, and a much greater movement and understanding of the way egalitarian societies actually, fun- egalitarian complex societies or even all egalitarian societies, how they mm. uh, reproduce themselves and exist, I would hope that it would help us realize the importance of collective solutions to social mm. problems. And perhaps mm. it would sort of act as a uh, as, as, as maybe a counterwind to the sort of I, I guess you're like describing the Fukuyama, the liberal approach to everything, the, the sort of hyper individualized 
homo uh, uh, the, the the homo economist the the yeah. maximizer I, mm-hmm. I, I think we have to accept the fact that there are lots of grand social problems that require collective responses on the mm-hmm. other hand those collective responses need not be driven by a uh, sort of coercive exploiting yep. elite like they can come yep. from uh, they, 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 they can come from sort of emergent bottom up processes and i think that's mm-hmm. very exciting because i think i think mm-hmm. that's a capacity in human political economy that's not getting nearly enough attention so to speak mm-hmm. it's almost been denied so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I hope that understanding sort of the, 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 the long, the, the deep history of egalitarianism and the deep history mm-hmm. of egalitarian growth and that, and that we're not necessarily moving through these discrete mm-hmm. stages like the neo-evolutionists sort of outlined, I, I think that's really important. That said, mm-hmm. I also think it's important to recognize that uh, there, there have been monumental changes over time and that you get all the and that the way bronze age egalitarian societies mm. operated yep. Yep. is fundamentally different from the way like a capitalist society operated so mm-hmm. the, the the sort of implicit interpretation of the end of civilization as kind of like peaceful traders i think is heavily mm. influenced by uh interesting glo- in sort of ancient globalization ancient uh, hmm. sort of mercantile activity. It's, it's, a, it's just ascribing causality to almost like this kind of like m- implicit proto capitalist group. And hmm. I think that's also, I think that's a misstep also. So the, yep. the bronze age economies are different from iron age economies are different from capitalist economies. And we have to understand yep. that. And at each, with each of these, with each revolution in time, the, hmm. the, the range of human possibilities has been uh, restricted and changed and modified. And so yep. we, we need to really do what we can to remember other ways. We, we, we need to have a very, I mean, Graeber talks a lot about political imagination. We need to mm. be sure we don't lose our political imagination. All right. Um, I think, I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.